It's good to be with you this morning. Go ahead and turn in your Bibles to the book of Matthew, chapter 12. That's where we will be today. And the question I have for you as you turn there, and as I get settled here, all the, all the things in place, <laughs> the question I have for you this morning, who are your people? Who are your people? Recently, I celebrated a birthday. Um, I would tell you my age, but... I, every time I'm asked, I have to think for a good 30, 40 seconds, wait, how old actually am I? Um, but either way, uh, celebrated a birthday uh, recently, and as is the custom for the church uh, staff team, the birthday celebrant gets to pick where we go for lunch. Everybody goes and gets uh, lunch together. So there are lots of different uh, culinary desires on our staff team. Uh, I, I think I'm probably, uh, at least in this case, uh, was somewhat of an outlier. But uh, growing up in the country, I wanted some good home cooking. Uh, so, Casey's Buffet. <laughs> uh, so some of you have been there. Some of you have been. I appreciate it. I may have just found my people, <laughs> right? So we, we walk in, and I'm immediately hit with all the nostalgia, uh, the, the wood paneling on the walls, uh, all the old Pepsi bottles, uh, Sundrop bottles, Mountain Dew bottles from the 70s, uh, the pictures of pigs uh, on the wall. I, I, I will tell people, uh, I don't trust the barbecue at any restaurant where there's not a picture of a pig somewhere on the wall or a porcelain pig somewhere near the register. That's, so, you know, if you're looking for a barbecue restaurant, look for the porcelain pig somewhere. Um, but I walk in, immediately, these are my people. People who are here for the type of food that I'm looking for, the type where there's... Uh, a good quart of butter just melted sitting on top of the mashed potatoes. Uh, where there's a sign above all the vegetables that says, all vegetables contain pork. <laughs> These are my people. <laughs> These are my people. Where the fried chicken tastes like it's still cooked in lard. These are my people. There's nothing fancy about them. They're just there to enjoy some food. I don't need uh, a plate. In fact, I picked up one plate and still had some stuff on it. I uh, said, I don't even care. I'm just, the people who eat at this place are my people. I can't help thinking that when I walk in there. These are my people. I get the same kind of feeling when I go to a baseball game. Uh, when I, I'm standing, whether playing, coaching, or watching, and, and you hear conversations uh, like, oh, that umpire strike zone is a little small today. Uh, or you, you hear, man, Billy's he's throwing really hard uh, today. You, you might hear uh, a, ball, a ball's hit to the outfield, and oh, that guy got a really good jump on that. So many little things that you hear, and okay, we speak the same language. And we know there's people sitting around watching a baseball game, and you're bored out of your mind. Because you think there is nothing going on here. It is so slow. Yet, for those of us who understand and appreciate it, you know there are thousands of little things going on between every pitch that you can pay attention to, that you can watch out for, that make a difference in the game. We speak the same language uh, as, as these people. Uh, we hang on every pitch, on every play. Uh, we celebrate the same triumphs and feel the same losses. And so I'm out of the baseball field, and I, I think these, these are my people. And so I wonder today who you would claim as your people. Who are your people? Are they the people who enjoy the same music as you? Would you call yourself a Swifty and spend 
a month's rent going to see one of her live shows, uh, to be around your people. Uh, maybe if you're of a different generation, uh, would you consider yourself a parrot head and you want to sit on the beach and just listen to some Jimmy Buffett? Are your people the ones who get up at 5 a.m., put on your shoes, and go for a 10-mile run? I can tell you they're not my people. <laughs> Are they the people you see at the gym getting in their second leg day uh, of the week? Are your people the ones who vote like you, who enjoy hearing, who follow the same politicians and, and hate what the other side is doing to our country? Are your people the ones who fight to save every puppy uh, that you see on the street? Uh, adopt every animal to give them a good home. If you know my wife, you know those are her people. <laughs> well, today I, I want to look for a little while at who Jesus says are his people. And who, by extension, should probably definitely be your people too. And to do that, we will look first at Matthew chapter 12. And before we read, would you pray with me? God, we thank you for the opportunity as always to come together to worship you, uh, to worship you through singing, to worship you through uh, encouraging one another, spending time together, to worship you through prayer and to worship you through the, the hearing and the preaching of your word. Lord, I pray that you would make this uh, an encouraging time, uh, a convicting time, a growing time for each of us. Um, Lord, would you give me uh, the words that you would say, uh, move my thoughts, opinions, and all out of the way, and would you cause all of us to hear from you, from your word? Would you make us more like Christ in the process? And would you be glorified? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So Matthew 12, just to give you a little context, is a, a fascinating uh, chapter of Scripture here. It's filled with Christ's interactions with the Pharisees. None of them are fun and encouraging times. I would say many of them, most of them, are not even uh, necessarily cordial in fact, it, it escalates, and by the end of the chapter, there's some pretty strong accusations coming from Jesus toward the Pharisees. The tension builds throughout the chapter as you know, the Pharisees seek to ask questions of Jesus to trap him, uh, to bring him down. And at one point, the Pharisees accuse him of operating in the power of Beelzebul, uh, operating in the power of uh, a demon. Later, Jesus confronts them and calls them a brood of vipers, an evil and adulterous generation. So throughout the chapter, you feel this tension rising as the Pharisees are determined to bring Jesus down. And into this tension steps Jesus' earthly family. So we know from later in Matthew and the other Gospels that Jesus had four brothers and at least a couple sisters it's debated whether at this point they believed in him, they believed who he was. Uh, it's debated whether they came to that belief during his life. But we, we do have at least one account of them in Mark 3 coming and trying to take him away because they believed him to be out of his mind. So this situation could be similar, um, could be the same kind of thing, or they could be trying to protect him from the Pharisees. Uh, but either way, his family is here asking to speak to him. And to see Jesus' response, let's read, starting in chapter 12, verse 46. While he was still speaking to the people, behold, his mother and his brothers stood outside asking to speak to him. But he replied to the man who told him, Who is my mother and who are my brothers? And stretching out his hand toward his disciples, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of the Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. While he was still speaking. So this is in the middle of his speaking to the Pharisees. Uh, in the middle of his, his teaching, his rebuking. 
In the middle of his preaching, his family interrupts. Now, I have no doubt that they mean well, uh, but they interrupt here the mission of the Messiah. They interrupt God incarnate, God in flesh. Sometimes family and friends can, can do that, can't they? They can interrupt from what you are called to do, from how you are seeking to honor the Lord, to, to walk with God. But what we see is Jesus could not be interrupted here. He could not be pulled away from his mission. He could not be pulled away from his work. In fact, he would use this moment as a teaching opportunity. Looking there at verse 48, we see his response. And we have to be careful here not to read into uh, what isn't there, not to read into or read our, our thoughts too much into it, because Jesus is not disowning his family here. Jesus isn't necessarily being rude. He's not rejecting the years of love and affection, uh, the times together, the memories, the connections built. Jesus' love for his family, keep in mind, was a perfect love. So he is not sinning against his family, um, disowning them, throwing them away. We know that his love for them was perfect, not because of uh, because we see that specifically pointed out in Scripture, but we know his love for them was perfect because we know that Christ was perfect, never sinning. And so imagine, I, I stopped to think about uh, that for, for a moment. You're the brother or sister of, of Christ. You have a perfect brother. I don't know if any of you grew up with a sibling who was seemingly perfect. Um, you start to get annoyed at even their perfection uh, but, but imagine here the blessing uh, that is there for these brothers and sisters. And I can't even be mad at you because you've never done anything wrong against me <laughs> either. Like, you're perfect toward me too. So I can't even be mad that you're perfect. Imagine as a parent, you know, I, I see my sin regularly both in my kids and how they act and how I respond to my kids. My sin is made plain by my parenting uh, but man, imagine how uh, that would feel parenting the perfect child. Uh, at least their sinful actions wouldn't bring out sin uh, on your part. But just, just thinking the, the blessing that it would be to be in the immediate earthly family of the Son of God. That's what they experienced. And so to hear this might have been uh, something that would take them aback. But, again, we know that Jesus doesn't disrespect or disown his family, but what he does do is point out the correct order of things. Spurgeon put it this way when talking about this passage. It says, Jesus does not reject the tender ties of his human nature, but he exhibits their true position as secondary to the spiritual bonds which united him to his spiritual family. So he puts things in the right perspective. He puts things in the right order. He points to his disciples, and what does he say about them? Verse 49 here. And stretching out his hand toward his disciples, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Here are my mother and my brothers. He claims them. What news for these disciples? Wait, he just, he just said, I was his brother, his mother, he just claimed me? These weren't people who were easy to claim either. They weren't impressive or cool or respected or anything good. They were the foolish, the weak, the embarrassing. Many of you know what it's like to be embarrassed by family. We've all got that. There's the one crazy aunt or uh, disrespectful kid that nobody wants to claim. Every family has uh, at least one person who's like that that no one wants to claim. If you think about your family and you can't think of one, it's probably you that no one wants to claim. <laughs> um, sometimes I think that's how my family is. 
Um, so be careful. Yeah, if you can't think of one, uh, might be you. But if you think about Jesus' family, it's the exact opposite. With the brothers, the mothers that he just claimed, there's only one that anyone does want to claim. And a whole slew of people you would never want to. So we see Christ's family is quite the opposite. And yet, Scripture says, he was not ashamed to call them brothers. So what is it that makes Jesus not ashamed to call them brothers? What causes him to proudly call them brothers, mothers, sisters, to identify them as his family. I think we have to look at the next verse. Verse 50, he says here, For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. So what causes him to proudly call them brothers? In a word, obedience. They do the will of God. It would seem here that your obedience is what Jesus says. Here's the criteria for brotherhood, sisterhood. Your obedience. I wanted to leave a pause there to just see how much squirming there was. (laughs) Because it's an odd thing to hear that obedience would be what caused them to call them brothers and sisters. Some of you were here and immediately you hear that and you're like, whoa, okay, let's, let's slow down now. Because those, if you've been around a Bible teaching church for very long, you're likely thinking that's not right. It's not by obedience. It's, it's only by his grace. It's only through faith. Some of you went straight to the Latin. Sola gratia, sola fide. Don't you bring that obedience in here. And you would be right. Hebrews 11 makes it plain that without faith it is impossible to please God. Ephesians 2 makes it clear as well that you couldn't do anything to earn right standing with God. You were dead in your trespasses and sins. And like we mentioned in the Exploring Church membership class this morning, that, that means, even in the original Greek, that means dead. That doesn't mean you were just in a little bit of trouble, uh, but you were dead in your trespasses and sins, meaning there's nothing you could do, no obedience you could muster on your own to make yourself right with God. Those who are in Christ were saved by grace through faith, not by works, so that no man may boast. If you were saved by his grace through faith, faith in his perfect life and death on your behalf, what in the world could Jesus mean here? For the answer to that, I think we have to look a few verses earlier. Again, when Jesus is talking to the Pharisees back in verse 32. Actually, I may not have the specific verse right. But you can find it earlier (laughs) in the chapter. He's talking with the Pharisees. And and he's talking about uh, the fruit that comes from uh, a good life. And what he says to them, either make the tree good and the fruit good, or make the tree bad and the fruit bad. For the tree is known by its fruit. For the tree is known by its fruit. I was only a verse off, 33. (laughs) Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad. For the tree is known by its fruit. So you see the obedience here, the doing the will of God, is simply the fruit of a changed heart. If you are in Christ, you will necessarily obey him. 
Will you obey him perfectly? No. But you will obey him. Because that is the fruit of your changed heart. So your obedience will be a clear sign to the world that you are his. And so it makes sense that Jesus would say, those who do the will of the Father are my brothers, sisters, mothers. Your obedience will be a clear sign that you are his. It's a little like the plants in my backyard. Uh, if, if you're like me, we, we try to clear out the, the weeds that grow and all. We fail to do a great job at that. And so especially around the fence in our backyard, there grow a number of weeds and vines and three-leaved plants. Many of you know there are lots of three-leaved plants uh, around here. Um, and early on in their growth cycle, it's hard to tell the difference sometimes. We, we've got Virginia creeper that's out there. We've got poison ivy. Uh, we've got dewberry. We've got other things. But it's hard to tell the difference uh, for a little while. But then in the spring, this wonderful thing happens. On some of these plants, you see these little red berries appear. They grow, they get bigger, they turn black, you pick them, you eat them, and you are amazed at how good this thing tastes that just came from a weed from my backyard. <laughs> All of a sudden, when you see those berries pop up, when you see that fruit grow, you immediately know, okay, that's, that's not poison ivy. In fact, that's a southern delicacy there, that southern dewberry, you could just sit in the yard and eat those all day. I'm told you could also take them and make great cobblers and jams with them. I haven't tried it yet. I'll let you know uh, when the weeds get bad enough in our yard that we have enough uh, to make that. But it's as soon as you see that fruit, you know, okay, that's, that's something good. That's not poison ivy uh, or anything else. So it is with those who are in Christ. It may not be easy to look at someone and identify them as a Christian by how they look, what they dress, uh, or how they dress, or, or, or anything like that. But when you see the fruit of their life, it becomes plain to see. No, they won't do it perfectly, but there's a pattern of living like Christ, a pattern of doing the will of God, obeying him. So these people who do the will of the Father are who Jesus claims as his people. So this is a tie and a bond closer and stronger than even with his own earthly family. He looks at his disciples and he looks at us and says, these are my people. What a glorious truth that is. If you have come to see your sin for what it is, rebellion against the holy God, if you've turned from your sin, turn to him for forgiveness, then you've been saved by Christ and he calls you his own. This is earth-shattering news. Jesus tells us who his people are. Not his earthly family, but those who do the will of the Father. So, now what? Jesus claims us as his people. What now? What do we do with that? What difference does it make in the here and now? Look with me at John 17, 3. I want you to see one thing, uh, that, an immediate application of this. John 17 uh, is a passage often labeled Jesus' high priestly prayer. We read in verse 6, this is Jesus speaking, praying, talking to his father. He says, I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Then in verse 9, I am praying for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. So before time, God set out to give a people to his son, a people who would, by grace, come to him, who would experience life with him 
who would praise him forever. We are his. And the Bible says that none can be snatched out of his hand. We learn here that part of belonging to Jesus means simply he is praying for you. He is talking to God the Father on your behalf. He's going to God, asking God to work on your behalf in your favor. And so the question is, what, is, what does he ask? When Jesus prays for you, what, what does he ask? And at least in this instance, we see, reading on, starting in verse 20, I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us. And then in verse 22, he says, that they may be one, even as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one. He prays for you to be one, for all who have been given to him to be one in union. Now, what does that mean, to be one? Well, it means that just like Jesus, you should be able to look at the believers around you, see their lives, and say, these are my people. If they are Jesus' people and you belong to him too, these better be your people too. And that's true of every believer across the world. That means you, if you are in Christ, have more in common, have a stronger bond with the convert in Iraq who just came to faith in Christ than you do with your high school best friend who doesn't follow Jesus. You have a greater bond with the immigrant who calls on Christ than you do your neighbor who eats at your table yet doesn't know Jesus. So who are your people? This bond is only made stronger when you who are in Christ follow him in close proximity with others. Maybe when you do that in the context of a local church. So that means whoever you've considered your community, how deeply you feel that connection, when you look around this room and see people who have trusted in Christ, who have been redeemed, bought by his blood, ultimately, and above all others, these are your people. When you look around, when you see people uh, who you know, who you see the fruit of their lives, and you can tell that they follow Christ. They are your people. So no matter how at home I feel when I eat at Casey's, no, these are my people. No matter how I can identify with people at the baseball field, no matter the language we share, uh, the fun times uh, that we have, I can look around this room See the fruit of your lives as you follow Christ and know that truly these are my people. So again, I wonder today, who are your people? If someone were to look at your life, who would they guess are your people? If they were to hear you talk, who would they assume are your people? Are the people who Christ claims as his own, do you claim them Two. Before we go, I, I want to leave you with three reasons to consider. Three reasons why this idea is so important. Reasons you need to be with your people, particularly your people, the local church. I want to give you three reasons. The first, you need to be with your people for your sake, for your own good. In Hebrews 10, verses 24 and 25 say, let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. See, you need your people because sometimes you will need to be stirred up. You won't feel up to loving others, up to doing good, up to following the Lord, up to reading the word, up to 
praising him in song. You might not feel like praying, but you will need some stirring up. You will need some encouraging. The Christian life is a, is a good and a joyous one, but it is not an easy one. And so you are going to need your people. You're going to need some people who are looking out for you. Acts 20, 28, and many other passages throughout Paul's letters speak to the elders of local churches who have been given the responsibility of caring for the flock. Acts 20, 28 says this, Pay careful attention to yourselves and all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. See, God has given a church body and its overseers to be able to care for you, to watch out for you, to spur you on, to walk with you as you follow Christ. Because you will need it. Because I will need it. On a regular basis, I will need that. You will need that. We all will. So, the first reason, be with your people for your sake, for your own good. The second reason, you need to be with your people for their sake. In the same way that it's about you, it's also not about you. You need to be with your people for their sake. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 uh, talks very similarly to what Ed read from uh, Ephesians this morning. 1 Corinthians 12, starting in verse 12, says this, For just as the body is one, And has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them, as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. So you see, there there are roles in the body of Christ that only you can play. Your people need you in those roles. Have you ever felt like in the grand scheme of your church body, you just aren't important, aren't needed? Let me tell you something that's not even close to the truth. That passage in Acts continues, and it says, Uh, To those who might be tempted to think that, on the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And so if today you feel like, well, I'm not not needed there, I'm not an important part of the body of Christ, God tells you here the opposite. You are, in fact, indispensable. And so your people need you. You're called to do a number of things in the church. Throughout the New Testament, there are a number of times uh, when the Bible says that we are to do things for one another. This isn't close to an exhaustive list, but here are some of the things you're called to. You're called to love one another, build up one another, accept one another, serve one another, forgive one another, comfort one another, teach one another, encourage one another, pray for one another. Again, that's not even close to an exhaustive list, but you're called to do these things. And how can you do these things if you aren't with your people? So the people of the church, your people need you around to do these things. You need your people for your sake, and you are needed among your people for their sake. Third and finally, you need to be with your people for the sake of Christ. What do I mean by that? We read earlier from John chapter 17. Now looking specifically at verse 23 there in John 17. 
Jesus says, I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one. And then he says, why? So that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you love me. He's praying that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know. Jesus said a similar thing just a few chapters earlier in John 13, 13, 35. says this, by this all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So if people around us will know, or by extension not know, Jesus, because of our unity or lack thereof, if people will know Jesus because of our unity and our love for one another, it might be one of the most important evangelistic things you can do to be with your people. Be with your people so that the world can see you being with your people. So that the world can see the love of Christ that is shared between those who know him. So be with your people, Christ's people, for your sake, for their sake, and for the sake of Christ being made known to the world. And what will be the end of all this gathering with God's people? If you turn to Revelation chapter 21, Revelation chapter 21, verse 3 You can read this with me. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. If you are in Christ, trusting him, following him as your Lord, doing his will, you are are his people. And he says it here, he will be your God forever. Praise God for a God who chooses us in the midst of our sin, who redeems us, who saves us to be his people. Praise God that he is a God who will be our God forever. Pray with me. God, we thank you that you did choose us as your people. We know you didn't choose us because of anything that we could offer. In fact, all that we could offer would cause the, or lead to the logical conclusion that that we should be chosen by no one. But God, you saw fit to redeem us, to make us into a people for yourself. Lord, I pray that you would make us like Christ, that we would see your people as our people, that as a result of our love for you, because of what you've done, we would be committed to loving your people the same way that you do. Lord, and as we do that, would you cause the world to see, would you cause the world to see not only our love for one another, but more importantly, your goodness to us your goodness and salvation that is offered to them as well. Would you cause people to know you, to trust in you as a result? And as always, would you be glorified above all? In Jesus' name, amen.